So let me welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we are going to be discussing a very important topic. And, and it's, so we've titled it The Art of Storytelling. And we have an amazing panel with us, which has been put together by uh, Susan Furness. Uh, so let's do the uh, introductions first. Uh, my name is Sharad Agarwal. I'm based in Dubai. And I'm the founder of OnlyWebinars.com. It's a platform we started some two years back, and we've been doing a lot of webinars, corporate webinars, and community webinars. We are almost on our 62nd webinar today, so it's been a you know nice journey. We've there have been a lot of learnings. I've met some amazing people both on the panel and in the audience, and our network is growing. We now have uh, north of 14,000 people who are part of the only webinars community. And we love uh, those interactions we've had with them. Uh, so um, yeah, so let's get started with today's conversation. I would uh, like to introduce to you Susan Furness. Uh, she's going to be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, most of you in the audience probably already know her because she's been a co-host with me for so many webinars over the years. And I've known Susan for 30 years plus. And she's just an amazing person. And describing her in a few words is a very tall order because she wears so many hats. She's a strategist, she's a communicator, she's into spirituality, uh, she's an edge walker. And to summarize, uh, she's a magician. So she can create uh, magic on the fly with words, with stories. And with that little introduction, I'm gonna hand it over to Susan to take this forward. I'll be there looking at the chat. So I do recommend our audience to use the chat to tell us where you're coming in from and please put in your comments or questions and we'll be happy to take them as we go along. So let's get started, Susan, over to you. Oh, you're so kind as always, Sharad. And it's just um, uh, really does make my day when we're in a room like this together. It's really, it's really super. And I just hope that, you know, some of that um, magic actually turns into meaning. But I've got a feeling today that it's going to be a very meaningful conversation. And it's all around the art of storytelling, Sherrod and everybody. And, and we've got that lovely little tag tagline, that, which I think you can just see behind my head here. Experience shared, change, shared, change lives. But telling the truth costs and of course there's some sort of hidden dynamics into that and to help me unpick those dynamics um, and to really unravel um, why we should actually tell stories of our own life um, and uh, and what we observe so that we get the the sort of real rawness the real the real ruddiness and the real reality of life so that those stories we tell can then indeed help others, help others positively and help amplify, you know, change and help amplify love and peace with a bit of prosperity in the middle for everybody here on, on earth. And, you know, today we've chosen to, um, we've put art in uppercase letters because we really want to honor art forms and the arts the arts uh, to uh, in its power to help us tell stories whether it's news stories real facts and figures or whether indeed it's fiction and non-fiction stories or indeed whether it's music whether it's poetry whether it's paintings of all genres and whether it's uh, books and scripts and indeed uh, film film play and theater and to help me do that, um, I've got four fabulous panelists in the room. And I'm actually gonna go around and introduce you, but I'm actually, do you know what I'm gonna do? I wanna hear your voices. So I'm going to introduce you by name and let us tell you, that you tell us uh, who you are and what you do for about 60 seconds, if you wouldn't mind. And um, I'm gonna start uh, just on my, I can't even tell if it's left or right, but Elizabeth, no, the other way, Elizabeth, <laughs> um, Elizabeth Burton Phillips, uh, MBE. Um, you know, as I said uh, earlier, 
a friend of mine for not so long, but very deep. Um, Elizabeth, tell us about you. Okay, so um, yes, I'm Elizabeth and I am a mum and wife and granny, and I am the founder of the charity Drug Fam. And I am a full-time volunteer for that charity. And I work with those who are affected by a loved one's use of drugs, alcohol, and gambling. I work with those who are bereaved as a result of their loved one's um, addiction to drugs, alcohol, and gambling. And I do a lot of educational work in schools, um, sharing my story and the work of the charity um, to enable young people to understand the impact of drugs, alcohol, and gambling on their family members. And um, I'm very passionate about the work that I do. And it's a very much lived by experience journey that I've gone on um, since losing my son, Nicholas, in 2004. Bless you, Elizabeth, and bless Elizabeth, uh, Nicholas, uh, too. Um, um, we'll come back to unpicking some of that in a minute, Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to go to Charles. You're sitting below me, actually, Charles, on my screen. Um, Charles Furness, um, actor, writer, director, and actually my nephew. So we better come clean on that, Charles. We've got the same name, so people might guess. But, you know, Charles, um, tell us about you. Why acting? Why writing? And why directing? I did think about changing the surname, but no, we have to come clean on that. <laughs> uh yeah uh my uh susan is my auntie and um shares in stories that we have around addiction in our family but yeah i'm i'm an actor uh from i live in south london i grew up most of my life in south london and i've been acting for 10 years and i'm recently transitioning into writing and directing and it happens that one of the first films that i'm going to make is around family around love around spirituality but also it touches on the subject matter of addiction um mainly from the point of view of the family so not the not the addict themselves although those are really heartfelt and needed stories to tell the only way i could be honest is tell from my perspective but uh, yeah i'm that's it really <laughs> And you're a damn good actor, Charles. Thank you very Charles, much. Charles, yeah, you're, you're a bit biased, good. but... <laughs> oh, uh, you know me, I tell it as it is. <laughs> and, and I think you're pretty good. And, you know, Charles has starred in The Whale with uh, Martin Sheen. He took the lead about 10 years ago with Charlotte Rampling in uh, Sense of an Ending, Silent Witness, and with that gorgeous Kiefer Sutherland in 24 and a lot more. So keep that up, uh, Charles. But we're really eager to to also get to grips with your words and stuff. So let's hear more about that in a minute. Thank and you. I'm going to go. Oh, you're welcome. I'm going to go over to um, uh, Renata. Renata, I'm not going to. Uh, well, I will. I'll try. Renata Van Nijen. And you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. She's going, no, you got that totally wrong. <laughs> so Renata. Our, our, our guest from uh, Granada, southern Spain. Well, that's where you're calling in from, but of course I know you are Dutch and from the Netherlands. So tell us a little about you, bit about you and that gorgeous art behind you. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, uh, my name's Renata. It's van der Heer, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, and I'm from Holland, but I came to Spain in 2003. Uh, with my then partner, who was a functioning binge drinking alcoholic. So that's kind of where my story starts, why I'm here. I've been a professional artist for 35 years in galleries uh, internationally. Uh, coming to Spain, life changed for many reasons because of my relationship and because of the situation where I am. I'm now married to a Spanish avocado farmer. Alcohol is no longer a problem in uh, my life, but I still have a huge passion for the subject and specific, specifically because when I was with my ex I felt totally confused because I didn't get it and, and you who ha have experience with it will get it uh, but it's a complex uh, situation and he was a super intelligent, intelligent beautiful soul and horrible when he was drunk and I decided to write a book about it 
uh, which uh, for which I interviewed 40 people plus, and it, it all came to me. I only put a note in Facebook looking for people to interview. I wrote the book in three months. It was kind of like I had to do this. And it was, I interviewed alcoholics, men, women from all over Europe, including someone from India. And they all told their stories very honestly, anonymously, and I've written them down in a storytelling way. And it's helped, it, it made me realize how important it is. And that a lot of people think they are alone and they're isolated and the focus in society is still mainly on the addict, on the alcoholic in this case, or other addicts, but on the addicts, you see a lot of documentaries, but so many people are affected by the, the addicts. And according to statistics, six people around the addicts, at least, so. I, I see quite, they're quite amazing statistics, um, yeah. yeah. Renate, thank you for pointing those out. So, you know, six degrees of separation, and it's probably less. And, and indeed, you know, your book called Cheers, The Hidden Voices of Alcoholism, those I hidden wrote, voices. Sorry, sorry yeah, that's, I, I probably sent you the wrong, I rewrote the book. It was written in 2011, and I revised it in 2020, uh, because a few stories were not, uh, there and sort of changed and it's now called breaking the silence one voice at a time it's still cheers cheers breaking the silence one voice at a time so sorry oh, if I oh, what, not, no, absolutely no apologies needed because these are all words each time you you're saying a word there Renata they're all so powerful so breaking the silence it takes me right into something that I know um, you have on some of your uh, collateral Elizabeth you know lives are worth talking about and to do that we need to break the silence yeah. and and yeah. these hidden voices in all um in in, in life in general are mm -hmm. often you know in family and friends and in community and in that note I'm sort of going to take it over to you Haida Al Haida Al Shabani who who interestingly I mean you've sort of taken the walk from uh uh, studying and being a junior, I believe, medical doctor, and then taking your observation and your care of us all uh, into the lens of a camera and really being able to fine tune indeed what it is that you see and bring it to screen. Can you tell us more about you and about that, Haida? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm an Iraqi Scot. Uh, I was mostly raised in Glasgow, Scotland. I currently live in London, not far from Charles, actually, um, one of the other panelists, uh, where I, in London, I work as a documentary maker, a producer. And that means I sort of, uh, sort of often find stories and shape them and bring them to an audience in a way that sort of I feel will touch them best, um, ways in which people can connect to other people's stories. Um, I'm also a keen writer and I'm sort of making my way into narrative films so movies and drama. Again, that's where I've been working with Charles Furness very closely, but my background is in medicine. Uh, I studied uh, to be a doctor and I worked as a junior doctor and I was on my way to being a forensic psychiatrist before I realized that I was actually just really interested in people's stories, possibly more than their like ailments and illnesses. Um, and although I think direct uh, doctors and nurses and health professionals do a lot, obviously a lot for people very directly, there's also other ways we can help people that are slightly less direct. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I kind of put all my energy. And, um, you know, it's, a t it's tough to compare yourself to doctors and nurses. They do so much for people, um, but there's other ways in which we can sort of, um, change people's lives or help sort of change the course of things and I think that's where we're all, why we're all here is that storytelling really is at the heart of that you know um so yeah that that's I think I've covered the basics I'm also a father you're a daddy yeah a daddy. little Amber's asleep somewhere in the background yeah. isn't she yeah yeah my daughter's asleep downstairs so um I don't hopefully she doesn't wake up but if she does she'll be making a guest appearance yeah <laughs> Well, we all hope room. she does. We yeah. all hope she does wake up. <laughs> a formal panel member. 
Yes, Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Um, I mean, I loved what Haida was saying there about, you know, the importance of words. And in fact, Renata and I just sort of mooted, you know, that vocabulary extension just a little earlier. And, and I know you do too, because indeed, um, and I don't know whether it was cathartic or, or, or indeed it's because you really wanted your story shared, but um, um, with the experiences with your gorgeous son, Nicholas, um, I know you wrote a book and I think it has the most awesome title, um, which is Mum, Can You Lend Me 20 Quid? So currency exchange, you know, <laughs> non you know, it could be any currency exchange. Elizabeth, tell us why words are so important and why you wrote a book. Thank you for asking. Um, I needed to find healing from an experience that I didn't understand, which led to the tragic loss of Nicholas and the journey of trying to tread water for such a long time um, with a life-changing illness that affected both of my sons. Um, that as an English teacher, I found that was my step to finding healing in the case of um, Nicholas's death, not understanding, of course, that by writing it down totally from the heart, that I was actually going to write a book because that wasn't my intention. It was just to find healing. And out of, out of the grief came the healing, came the story, and came the play and all that's, all that's evolved in the charity from that. So the, the experience of, of grief with the loss of Nicholas and the relief with the other twin still living was, was something I needed to find a conduit for, and I found it through that book. Oh, bless you for writing it, Elizabeth, because I know that indeed has helped so many. Um, and, and, and just so that we can give personality and name and honour to everyone, what's the name of your son, your, your other son? Uh, my surviving son is called Simon. Simon. So hi, Simon, if you're watching. Lovely to have you with us. Elizabeth, while we've still got you there talking, I mean, can we sort of just unpick something maybe from maybe the glossary of Drug Fam, which I know is a charity that helps thousands and thousands of family members throughout the year. I think you're 24-7, 365 days, I believe. Um, yes. Addiction. I mean, is there a definition for addiction or, or, or how do you how do you convey this to families that call you in turmoil over to you Elizabeth well they convey it to us it's the truth <laughs> and because that what they're talking about is a, is, a, is a sort of pattern of behavior life-changing behavior um, that they're seeing in their son their daughter their partner who whoever it is that they're contacting us about um, more often than not it's a step into the water of a telephone call or an email to us um, where they're seeking answers because they don't understand how to cope with a life changing pattern of behavior. And there's a lot of self blame, uh, a lot of anger, a lot of guilt, all sorts of myriads of emotions going on in their head. Um, and all they want to do is to make their loved one well. So addiction, a pattern of behavior that becomes uncontrollable and life changing. Yeah, uncontrollable and life-changing and you know my observation is of course um you know having experience of um uh many addicts within the family and of course we should also perhaps say that you know I even show signs of addiction although it's not to substance of any kind thank goodness but indeed I don't stop working you know, and some could say that that's an aholic too. You yeah. know, it really, yeah. you know, I'm 64 yeah. now. I mean, work has just consumed my every day, you know, since about the age of uh, 18. You know, so and I, and I, so I, you know, so it almost is like something that we, that, that we, we, we don't drop it for life. 
if you like. And, and I right. wonder, yeah, yeah. I That's wonder, right. Charles, I, if I come to you listening to what um, Elizabeth is endorsing and have said, I mean, from your lens as um, um, a son and a brother and a nephew, you know, in an environment of addiction, and indeed now that you're taking that through the lens of a writer, do you have any sort of um, glossary, glossary for us around addiction? And indeed, why um, talking about it is important. Over to you. Yeah, I just want to touch on what Elizabeth said in terms of finding healing through uh, writing. I think um, I think part of me consciously knew that I was doing that when I was writing my screenplay, but it wasn't so conscious in it. And now, uh, when I look back on it, as I as I read it again and again, there is there is a younger me trying to find understanding in a world where he couldn't understand what was going on so that writing this and making this film is somewhat me trying to find healing and naturally with those these things i think the more personal a story like elizabeth's story and ho hopefully my story the more personal the more kind of find the detail you make that story i think it will become universal and i think many people will relate to those stories even if they don't have or, or suffering from addiction within the family i think there's many things around the the kind of uh things that are that happen within addiction that people can relate to in terms of family in terms of dynamics within family being pulled apart uh, love i think addicts and people in the family that have addiction I think especially in my family that it's somewhat from this kind of uh, hard thing the love of our family has grown ever strong from that so not only is it the difficult things there's so many universal beautiful things that come from from that and in terms of my experience I guess as a young person what Elizabeth was saying is like trying to fix it, trying to understand it as a mother. From from my, I was lost in the world as a young person. I didn't know what was going on and I was desperately trying to hold on to things as my life was being kind of moved from there to there because of addiction. So my story touches on that, but it also touches on a young person trying to grasp hold of something and trying to help, but obviously falling short of that because um they're, they're a young person well you're not falling short of it now Charles because you know indeed you're telling a story and as we've said that you know just by sharing is so comforting and indeed can build love and and you also said something there about learning about things you know about getting information and indeed you did too Elizabeth of course you know people are calling in to drug fam to try and understand something and Sherrod we've um, found I saw you nodding through Charles's conversation there you know we've found a lot haven't we through all topics of um, webinars 62 webinars over the last two and a bit years that people come on to share information and that information really really does help I don't know it seems to bring community it finds unity and it gives you courage do you want to just talk to that for a minute Sherrod and you've got your hand up and I was coming uh, to you yeah sure um, actually in one of the earlier webinars I did narrate this story and I happened to meet um, a person his name is Emmanuel Cusada he's originally from Puerto Rico settled now in Australia and he had an addiction to social media. He is a 24 year old. He was addicted to social media and he was spending 14 to 16 hours on it. And all he saw was his friends going on these fancy holidays, driving these exotic cars. And he felt totally left out of the mainstream. And it drove him almost to try and take his life on a couple of occasions. His family, due to their alertness, kind of saved him. And when he was seeing a doctor, uh, he uh, gave him an ultimatum. He says, look, son, if you're just going to die or you have another option, which is to change the world. 
And that was his wake up call. He was then 18, I'm told, Emmanuel Cusada. And he decided the second option. And he started, he's in the metaverse field, all right? He's a blockchain programmer to give you a little background. So he has now created a metaverse called Utopia. You can Google it, U hyphen Topia. And the model of this uh, metaverse is to keep people safe in the metaverse. And I think he is going to change a lot of lives. I know he's partnered with uh, Disney World in Florida because they know how to keep people safe in the real world. So he's taken their best practices, developed an algorithm on blockchain, implemented it on Utopia. And the best part is Utopia is a layer that sits on top of any metaverse. So once he is ready to go to market, which will be sometime next month, I'm told, then every metaverse will be safe. And we don't want our children to be going to casinos or watching adult material or using parents' credit cards. And uh, so there's a story right there of an addict who decided to change the world and he's well on his way. He's 24 now. 24, I met him, yeah. yeah, I met him two weeks back in Dubai and all is good. His life has changed by 360 degrees. And he's almost like a role model for me. So I, I uh, like he's amazing. I'm so yeah. pleased that you yeah. brought up Emmanuel. I mean, he's an amazing young man. And indeed, he came in like from the audience into one of our panels about five months ago, didn't he, Sherrod? And he's just motored long since then. It's just been awesome. And I mean, Elizabeth and, and Renata, I'm going to come to you next. But Elizabeth, you know, we uh, Sherrod then just sort of picked on keeping us safe in the digital world and keeping yes. us safe in the metaverse, and particularly mentioned gambling, for example, and the things that our children are exposed to. Do you have anything just to say about that, just general, over to you? Yes, um, very much so. I mean, we're very aware um, of this um, this uh, being, I don't know if you can see, I'm holding up my phone, but, uh, you know, the phone is the conduit for so much through Instagram, through Snapchat, you know, for people being groomed into young lives, being groomed into gambling, being groomed into drugs, uh, and, you know, county lines, all, all of these problems. So very much I am on that page with you, Susan. Oh, thank you for, I, I knew you would be, um, Elizabeth, and I'm sure yeah, you know, it's just going to amplify um, mm -hmm. sort of the the knowledge we need to gather, which is, of course, where, as Sherrod and I always say to anyone that comes into our metaverse panels, we're all learning this together. There is no yes. expert. We're all learning this together. And indeed, aren't we just all learning life together? Right. Yeah. And that comes back to our sort of subtitle of today, you know, experiences shared change lives you know because it's not until we experience something even if we know about it uh, already someone's told us but it's uh, we need to experience things sometimes ourselves but of course telling the truth does cost it costs you know it costs emotionally it can cost in relationships and in love and it costs a lot of money as well sometimes to tell the truth um so my dear Renata I I'm going to come over to you and you know, we've talked a lot about words, um, including your own book, um, the 2011 dis uh, edition and the renewed 2020 edition. But let's talk about other art forms, because, you know, I know you're multi-talented and we're so thrilled to have you, you know, from fashion design through to all mediums of art. Can you sort of tell it? No, come on. I mean, honour yourself. And you also... Uh, well, look, Renata, I, I've not known her long, but what I do know is during this curious corona time, um, Renata uh, took the transition online and has really held many in community learning how to paint and learning about art online around mm -hmm. the world. Now, isn't that incredible? So, Renata, just talk to us a little bit about the communication power of art over to you yes well thank you for your kind words and uh yeah for me well for me art and writing and i do want to bring it back also to the addiction situation it kept me sane in my relationship 
And as uh, Elizabeth, I think, said something about healing, it's healing to write. And it certainly was for me healing to write. But I also know that for, it's healing to read other people's stories that are yeah. like your stories. And a lot of what you all said, I can relate to that. And that's what I found through my interviewing other people, through what I wrote, my own story. Yeah, and art, art is very powerful. It, it, I, I believe art, first of all, it, it changes a house into a home. That's one thing. And I, I love it. And I, I've got, I have mandalas, maybe you can see that, but I also read flamencos and Buddhas and, and women's, sensual women. I've, I've written nine books so far. Uh, my last book was actually as a journaling book. So that comes a little bit back to what we're talking about. And it's actually called How Not to Live with an Alcoholic. And the not is between brackets because I'm passionate about this subject because I, I don't even know exactly why, because I've moved on, but I hear stories. And every time I talk to someone, they say, oh, my father, my mother, my sister, my uncle, they, they were alcoholic or are alcoholic. And it's so widespread and it's so not talked about. And actually when Elizabeth, when you said grooming, grooming through the internet, grooming through uh, for a dick for gambling, I, I would go as far as to say grooming through advertising. If you look at I cringe when I watch the, the, the alcohol. I'm, I'm coming back to the alcohol because that's the subject that I can relate to. Um, the, the, how they portray alcohol is always young, fabulous, happy people. But from what I've learned from that I have interviewed, for example, one lady, she was never an alcoholic. She wasn't raised like that, but she became an alcoholic because after her situation changed, she started watching television and she saw people in talk shows and. And the, the always there was always a glass of wine, and, and the, the, you know the the, the, the soap store story series with, with like Carnation Street. There's always a bar involved, and she started drinking because of that, and she became a full blown alcoholic. And I think it's not recognized. This this is this is far bigger than what's recognized. And I, I presume Elizabeth, you agree, and, and I presume this that people don't know, they don't understand it because yeah, it's such a double sword thing, isn't it? If you're, yes. if you're, if you're not drinking, you're boring. If you're, if you're getting drunk, you're, you're, you're a loser. I mean, you can't win. We, we, we live in a really weird society and it's everywhere. So, and Renata, let's, let's take it there then, you know, about this interesting thought about how we win. But I, I'd rather I'd like to sort of take that back into art form, and 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 I and and I want to honour you and let you honour you for your your power and prowess of helping others communicate through art. So so tell us about that. What's it like to hold a room and see those that maybe have never picked up a brush actually begin to communicate? Over to you, Renata. Yeah, thank you. I love that. I absolutely, and, and, and also I, I have been teaching art since 2006, also in my studio here in my house, and since 2020 online, which is very well possible to my own surprise. But what, what is beautiful, and the way I teach is not like everybody the same thing, and then you compare the way I, what I like is to let people find their own style, they find their own voice, so to speak. And, uh, and just, and it's beautiful to see what happens when people and I love that I love to uh, I love to encourage with positivity I love there's always something good you can see so you can say oh look at this little bit that's fantastic and if you just would do this or this then you will see it will just and and I love that and I think I'm good at that and, and I, I know you're good at that and, and tell me as well just before we go to you Haida so get ready um Renata, when um, you see somebody sort of go, gosh, you know, I've never picked up a brush and they and then they get in and they start creating. And no doubt you give everyone an opportunity to talk to the room or even talk to themselves about what they're created. How is that? What emerges when someone sees that they indeed can turn some turn paint and a brush and a canvas into something? Over to you. Thank you. Most come in and say I can't paint, and then I'm always saying the same thing. I'll tell, I'll, I'll show you that you can. 
because everybody can paint. If you can draw a straight line or a little circle, then, then you can do it with guidance, whether that's from me or from another teacher, it doesn't really matter. But the, yeah, how they, they react is always surprised. Um, um, most of them, well, I've never had someone walk away unhappy, but maybe they did and didn't tell me. But what, what, I, what I feel <laughs> and what I experience there is they're really, really happy. And I've got a few that have moved on and, and are actually now established artists, which I absolutely love. because well, I, I mean, it's so wonderful then to honour somebody else's great achievements, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And indeed, I don't know um, if anybody else in the room has heard this phrase or even been involved in it, but um, there's something I know called art therapy, you know, where you really just get in there and get all dirty and, and you know, and just paint. And indeed, I'm sure Haida, Amber and all little ones show us, don't they, that they just get their hands in there and they start creating. So, yeah, heart, heart, heart therapy. You see what I said there? I didn't say art. I said heart therapy. I mean, how, how amazing is that? And Haida, you are nodding. So let me take it over to you and just give us some lens, you know, lens of the junior doctor, lens of the cameraman, lens of the documentary uh, producer, lens of the father, and lens of the friend of addicts. I mean, tell us your stories and or, you know, whatever comes to you. In, in this sort of form of storytelling and why it's so important. Over to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's two things that I'd like to kind of like, sort of they've come come to mind and I've just been taking some notes from what people have been saying because there's, there's a lot of really amazing points to touch on. And the two things I'd like to talk about are sort of sharing, not telling, which is something which is I think quite relevant with children is that sometimes you tell them things like don't do that but sometimes you also show them things and they often are more likely to follow than when you say to them don't do this you know if they mm -hmm. see you doing something they can kind of copy or absorb that and then the other thing I'd like to talk about is uh sort of wisdom and experiences the kind of power of those things so uh yeah I think storytelling's like it's it's, it's everybody knows what you mean when you say storytelling, but in a way it really should be story sharing, especially what we're talking about now. Um, telling is one way of communicating information and ideas. It's useful sometimes. Uh, and sharing is a little bit different and it's sometimes more powerful um, because it can often sort of demonstrate a situation to people and they can draw their own conclusions and they can take their own learning points. Um, so these sort of deeply moving experiences and point of views that we're hearing about have kind of uh, something inside them which has a certain quality, it's a certain type of information that I think can touch people in a different way than just telling them. Um, and that kind of goes back to the role of storytellers in our, in our society. Um, you know, we talked about books and poems and artwork and films and all these things, and they are definitely classified as art uh, often or kind of creative um, outputs. But there's also storytelling in other areas of life, you know, that, you know, are sort of less obviously creative, you know, just whatever that might be, you know, in the office or with your neighbor or like, you know, uh, having a chat with somebody um, over the phone. Um, and, and so the storyteller is something which I think we've all, we, we can all become now, but actually it's a storytellers had an important role at the heart of communities for like millennia. They, they're, they're people that were, they had a very specific role. Um, this is across the globe in different cultures. There, there would have been somebody who transmitted information in the form of stories that was very useful for people at that time in that place. And often inside those stories, whether they were, uh, uh, you know, total truths or just one person's point of view there was information that was that was passed on because it would help people uh should they come across a struggle or a challenge and um, they would have some tools to deal with that struggle or challenge in their own way they could draw on the wisdom and of course we don't often have those storytellers now so it's, it's all i think it's our job now as parents or in our different jobs or you know as friends and 
you know, uh, people who've experienced things to pass on that knowledge, you know, uh, now. And uh, that, that sort of brings me on to the sort of other thing, which is the kind of uh, type of information that we're talking about here. Um, I think uh, often subjective information, so the experiences of people, the experiences of all of the panel and also everybody else in the room, um, that information has a quality that you don't find in objective information. You don't find it in science. There's strengths in the type of information you have in science, which is about absolute truth. Um, but personal stories touch people in a way that moves them and it changes mm. you and it can change your course. And um, I think that that's kind of where I stand on this thing where I, you know, I don't have anyone in my family who's, uh, that I know of that's been affected or my direct family affected by addiction, you know, uh, in a direct way, but I have friends, um, Charles being one of them, we work closely and we become friends. Uh, I don't know if it's before or after working with each other, but through it. And um, what I can see is that the process of ha hearing about other people and also being able to tell his story um, is, 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 is giving other people information but him, also himself sort of helping himself grow and change and move and and I think this is where I'm at when I'm sort of hearing from everybody is there's a sort of quality here in sharing not telling that um is sort of it's really important to sort of hone in on and uh I think all of us can find it useful whatever we've experienced whatever struggles um in maybe not stopping other people from going through the same thing, but at least giving them tools so that they can understand what's happening around them better. Yeah, and I, I, that's so beautifully said, all of that. And, and also that we're not alone. You know, we mm. are not alone. That's so powerful. And, and you, you did say some real golden nuggets there. And thank you, Sharad, for being so nimble, throwing that into chat sharing not telling you know so uh, story sharing or the art of sharing as opposed mm. to the art of telling i mean how wonderful is that and sharad you were nodding heaps there particularly around wisdom and experiences and growth <laughs> you know i mean at the end of the day we've all got to grow right whether it's growing ourselves grow in community grow in societal impact grow in business sharad have you got any words to say around what you're hearing yeah i mean it was almost a mic drop moment for me uh, from heather so story sharing is very powerful and i think the power of community needs to be emphasized here so I'm in the process of building a community right now. It's of course uh, more technology related, but it's a group that we have created called Meta Shapers. So if anybody is interested in joining, it's meta-shapers.com. I'll put it in the chat. So um, we are building this community of like-minded people and we've got together uh, almost 200 plus people from five continents. And it's an amazing, uh, cohesive group. We are also on WhatsApp, about 50 of us. And we support each other in terms of knowledge sharing, in terms of helping uh, people uh, launch their projects. Uh, so community building is not easy, I have to emphasize. Uh, you know, it takes its toll. Uh, you have to have a lot of patience, perseverance. You have to sometimes take the back seat, just be a good listener. So it's not always about storytelling or story sharing. I think a very important component of that is to listen to other people's stories. And there are a lot of learnings there. Uh, and on our platform in Meta Shapers, we are providing an opportunity to people uh, to share their experiences. And it, they come from different backgrounds, different cultures. So the way you know people from Korea would uh, you know, interpret something that's said by somebody from a Western country is quite different. So in that sense, yeah, words matter, voice and vocabulary has to be spot on. And the power of community is amazing. It's a game changer. And whenever, you know, we have an issue, we just put it out there. And soon enough, almost in real time, people uh, just come back with their suggestions or they guide us to a resource. So, so my point is community matters. And we should all have that sense of belonging to whatever community we choose uh, to be part of. And we must also create content because I do find some people who are just consuming content, 
But I think the onus is on people to be active and be participative and uh, share and create content on an ongoing basis. So that's my two cents on that, Susan. Well, I think you gave us great value for the two cents there, Sherrod. And, and do please put the MetaShapers website uh, in, uh, web address in the, in the chat. And um, to go on from young Lexi, who said, you know, uh, 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 one team, one dream. Yeah, I liked your phrase, sharing is caring. A bit cheesy, we've heard it before, but really, isn't that a good one? Sharing is caring. And I also just want to pick up on content, particularly in this digital world. You know, we, we still need to remain decisively human, don't we? And Elizabeth, I mean, your team have to remain decisively human on the end of the telephone or a Zoom screen. Yeah, I'll come to you on all of that in a moment. And, and, and I just want to take on content. You know, you don't always have to create content. You can co-create, but better still, you can curate. You know, so sharing is caring. Sharing is sharing content as well. And that way we can therefore help the cyberspace, help Web3, help Web2, um, be content, not content obese and not information starved. We don't want content obesity or information starvation, do we? So sometimes curating by taking others' content, crediting them and sharing it is very, very powerful. And so, Elizabeth, I'm going to kick, kick you out for the minute and go to Charles, but come back to you on community in a moment, Elizabeth, and how we manage that. So, Charles, you know, we've been hearing so much here from everyone, uh, particularly your wingman, uh, Haider, and also, you know, from the essence of working with people in art online through with Renate. Renata, um, tell us, Charles, what's going through your minds and where would you like to take this conversation? Over to you. Well, um, what, what I was thinking about as everyone was, was talking and the points that, that were being made was um, how the con uh, content that we create and uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, Sharab was talking about social media addiction and uh, his friend that was addicted to that. He was probably also addicted to content, but not necessarily um, th maybe thought out content. Maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was um, you know, stories that were kind of, I don't know, but they weren't. So what, what I'm trying to get at is that is we should be kind of meaningful and thought out and what, and what we create. Um, I think that's important. I also, even though, you know, my story that uh, just us is um, quite a hard hitting story. A lot of it, a lot of the film has entertainment and fun and life and spirituality and humor uh, around it as well. So you said something about not feeling alone. I think as an actor, why I became an actor, why I joined that community was that at some points in my life, I felt alone. And then I found the people that I was meant to be with. So in terms of acting and in other parts of my life as well. Um, and what Sharab was saying about kind of international communities and sh sharing stories from different Korea and different places like that. I think they all have their individual stories that they are, that, that they should tell and important stories. But I, uh, for, for my film, Just Us, I, I actually watched the film uh, called Nobody Knows by um, a Japanese director, Hirokida Kurida. I think I've got his name right there. And I watched that film and it made me think about my childhood. And then I wrote my film. So uh, I'm not shy in kind of name dropping him because he's a, an amazing director. And, you know, a lot of his film inspired my film. His film isn't about addiction. It isn't, you know, it isn't directly related to, to, to my life. But in that film, a young boy is kind of, trying to pick up the pieces because it's about a, an abandonment case in Tokyo in 2004, when my film is set in 2004. So there's a lot of cross things. But the main point I'm getting at is that that film was made in Japan, in Tokyo, yet someone in London, in England, watched that and thought about their own life and then thought about their art and their story that they could tell from that. So I think that's a really important point. It is indeed. And you know what that brings me to something else. I think um, I think it was you that said it, Sherard, you know, about 
at listening as well. Um, not always telling, I'm not always sharing, but listening. And of course, the art of active listening is indeed an art in itself. And, and often by listening, listening carefully with love and compassion, you can actually hear the words not spoken. The words not spoken. And often it's those words not, that not spoken that hold both pain and gain. You know, they can be amplified even in their sound of silence. So Elizabeth, so coming over to you where you actually host a team and please tell us about your fabulous team. We want to honor them who, who actually are there to listen, to pick up those phones, you know, every hour of every day. And in do that, in doing that, build almost a um, when I say an invisible community, you don't obviously connect everyone together, but they know they're held in common unity. Actually, that's beautiful. If you break the word community down in the middle, it actually is common unity. So yeah. they hold them in common unity. Talk to us about drug fan and community and listening, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yes, it's a really important um, part of the work that we do in the sense that all of those who contact us are coming from that position of loneliness and isolation and possibly feeling stigmatized by being you know a family member of a loved one who is using drugs or alcohol or, or gambling and it's being able to share their story with somebody on the end of a phone or through a, a meeting like this on Zoom or Teams or whatever platform that they can speak face to face and to share the story. And we listen, we are there to give them that emotional support. And we listen to their stories and what they want to offload and how much they want to share with us and offer them the opportunity to join other communities. For example, communities that meet in the evening on, on, you know, on platforms like this, where another community of, of a safe space is developed. Um, and you, what you see coming out of those other communities are huge support and love for one another and caring for one another. And this is um, sort of like a, a spinning off all the time, the sharing of the, of the truth, coming from taking that courageous step of, of sharing to somebody on the end of our phone or um, through an email and then one of our team picking up. So we have a, an amazing team of people who work during the day and we have um, uh, volunteers as well so that we're able to offer this service nine till nine, 365 days a year. It's just outstanding, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And in fact, one of our uh, audience today, Mark Wentworth, has actually um, given us some more vocabulary to play with, you know, from storytellers to story doers. And it seems to me that, you know, your team, you know, are there listening very, very actively, listening to stories so it can then be go out and help them do something different with their lives. So thank you so much, Mark, for contributing there. Um, well, this is all getting so very, very powerful. I'm really, really quite um, full and not know where to take all of this, except that I want to take it in to some tangible areas, if it's OK, Sherrod. Um, I mean, Elizabeth, a lot of us can become doers, can't we? Um, we can we can um, join Drug Flam online or in the room at your conference this year in October, October the 8th, I believe it's the first you've been able to hold in person yes. two years because of yes. this curious corona time. So and, and this year it's all about um, all about it's about everything we've been talking about today. But there's also holding very tenderly bereavement. And mm -hmm. of course, you know, bereavement is well, you know, it can touch us so deeply. But as we know, you know, we can't really hold grief unless we've really loved, right? Mm -hmm. So so tell us a little bit how we can take part and support your conference and drug fan in October. Okay, um, so for anybody who would like to attend in person instead of um, online, um, there are places available um, for a bereaved family member 
um, on Saturday the 8th of October. The conference title is The Impact of Grief on Family Relationships. And that's very, very poignant because grief comes in many different forms. Um, with active addiction, you're losing the person that you once remembered to the, you know, to the physical, physical loss and to the, to the death of the person. So we have um, some fantastic speakers, all of whom are lived by experience. We have two professionals speaking as well. And so there are opportunities for you to join us online if you're very a, a long way away. Um, if you want to come in from overseas, I think we've got a, a thousand places. Um, and also we have um, some 90 places available at the hotel. And I'm just so enormously proud of those people who are going to come and tell their stories and shed tears and and support one another because everybody in that room on that day, whether in the virtual room or in the physical room, will be caring and loving for everybody who is there. Oh, well, you know, again, we said caring is sharing, didn't we? And mm -hmm. and it's it's um, so crucial that we do that. And it's so crucial as well that we show up. But yes. showing up takes a huge amount of courage, yes. doesn't it? And, and a little earlier, I sort of... Um, did some wordplay with you know the heart of telling or the heart of sharing yeah. as we're now saying um you know it takes it takes a lot of courage and courage some of you have heard me say this before um Renata are you a French speaker among your four or five languages that you speak Renata Did you speak I'm studying French. Uh, I okay. Speak, I speak so, five lang like other languages, but studying. Okay, French. you're studying French. So, what's the what does cour what does cour mean in French, or what's yeah, I think it's heart. Heart, yeah. yeah. And so it is indeed, but it's spelt slightly differently than the first part of courage, which is C O U R, of course, but it's C O U E R. But if you take courage and split it like we just did with community to get common unity you actually get the heart age, the heart mm -hmm. age. And so along with the digital age and the age of spirituality and the age of storytelling, we have, if we bring our heart into that, wow, what, what, in, what stories, what caring, what empathy, what compassion, what wisdom, and indeed what growth we can all have. And so Haida, I'm going to take that over to you. You've got your hand up so you can go with whatever was in you and uh, mix it up with anything else you've heard in between. Over to you. Yeah, so, I mean, I think uh, one of the things I'd quite to, quite like to kind of like finish off with is, is, is about stories. Um, again, going back to this idea of stories and um, the way that we grew up as children is we learn about stories as having a beginning a middle and an end and in reality our lives there's not really a beginning and an end we kind of sort of perceive we perceive a beginning and end it's how we kind of create it in our minds and this can be difficult in the struggles of life and the kind of chaos that we face uh, not just um, uh, in situations involving addiction but also just in in, the, in other struggles that that people face um, and what I've witnessed making uh, or writing this film with Charles, writing his film, is that uh, he's actually grown through, through, through preparing to tell this story. He's actually understood the whole scenario better. He's understood how it's impacted on him and he's understand, understood the, the impact addiction had on his parents uh, um, and, 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 and other members of his family. Um, and so, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that um, by telling stories and processing the kind of chaos of life, we kind of can start to begin to have an impact on the end. We might not make the end, we might not totally change the outcome, but how we perceive it is, is a massively important uh, uh, part of how we go on to live our lives. And just very briefly, just as the film that Charles and I have uh, um, are, are kind of going to make this film has been written but is still to be shot is a story of a young boy's last summer of innocence um, he plays out with his friend uh, on the estate whilst his mum struggles with addiction and it's actually a story of love uh, between friends and between mother and son 
And what I witnessed with Charles is that, you know, um, we've created a story that's very specific to the situation that he's been in, uh, the life that he's lived, but also universally uh, understandable. People who have not experienced addiction will connect with this because it's the usual stories of love, conflict and hopefully resolution. And through writing a story and conveying it and sharing it and also listening to other people, um, we believe that we're going to actively have an impact on how people perceive addiction and the effects it has on people. We're not changing the outcome necessarily, but we're reshaping the way in which it's seen. And, you know, I mean, definitely Charles can talk a lot about the kind of positive outcomes that he's experiencing now later in life, having had so much conversation with his family that, uh, that, you know, has been beneficial in another way, you know? So, so I think, uh, other than talking about our film, which we hope you will take interest in and uh, hopefully um, maybe be able to have a little bit look at online. We have a Kickstarter. We're kind of getting ourselves ready to shoot that. And um, we're obviously looking for some support, but also think about, uh, um, you know, changing the way that you perceive the end um, in your life, uh, in the experiences you've had and uh, taking on the experiences of other people because it can influence your understanding of your own situation. Well, powerful, profound. Somebody else was saying they're profound. Change the way you see the end. And in fact, um, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, who I often quote, don't I, Sherrod? You know, his um, book, new book is The Infinite Game, which was first part of something written many years ago by James E. Cass, you know, the infinite game, indeed, is there an end? Um, so uh, an interesting, Charles, that you you appeared in that film with Charlotte Ramping and John Broadbank, uh, a sense of an ending, because you don't know the ending, you can only sense it, right? You don't know the future, you can only sense it, right? Um, um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add to what you're hearing uh, Haida and everyone say? And then I'm going to come to you, Charles. Elizabeth. I, I think that, uh, can, are you, you hear me OK? Yes, it's not an echo. OK, um, I th what I'm sensing and feeling from all the conversation is how much we are a community here of hearts and minds. And I'm, you know, deeply uh, moved by what everybody is saying and it'd be interesting to hear uh, what the audience might want to ask us as well um, but, but I, I just am very moved by the unity the community that we have created here this afternoon. Yeah me too and indeed our audience are being I think I think I'm going to take it, audience, that this is all landing beautifully for you because there aren't any questions, but there are lots of um, good feed forward, you know, from Julia. Thank you to everyone for all that you're doing. From one of your colleagues, um, uh, Elizabeth uh, Karen, who, who works with you at Drug Fan. So, and of course, uh, I mentioned Mark and a few others earlier. So, so, um, uh, and of course, many of you will be listening to this online on recording later. We've had together with the panel just about 30 people in the room today. And, you know, as you always say, Sherrod, you know, you're in the moment, those that need to be in the room turn up to hold the space and make it so that it then generates on for those that listen to this conversation afterwards. This is a this is an organic conversation right Sharad? absolutely and we reach a larger audience uh, you know post the webinar through social media through recordings and podcasts so every conversation that we've had has touched a lot of lives and um, it has uh, you know resonated with our audience in a very nice way and so will this conversation i think we should give the last word to young charles in the room we should indeed, Charles. And I'll just add something after that. Charles, take it from Sherrod. Away you go. Thank you, guys. Um, someone just said, Karen, often we often in life if we are able to turn pain into purpose. I think as you get off the back, what Karen said and what Haida and Elizabeth have just said is that um making my film just us or, or writing it and hopefully uh, making it this year is that if I would have made this film maybe 10 years ago, it would have been a completely different film. 
because I think I was harboring still a lot of pain, a lot of confusion. I was still quite young. So given that those 10 years have passed, I think the film now is much more, it's much more honest and much more truthful. It probably would have been honest and truthful before, but in terms of my perception of the past, my perception of the family, my perception of addiction, my, my perception of addicts or, or my parents in this case, is that I hold a lot of love and more understanding. So hopefully through the film that I make, this will come through. Although it is from a perspective of a young boy who's hurt and confused, now the director, who was a hurt and young and confused young boy, has a lot, has 10 years, well, many more years experience to look back on that time and hopefully paint the picture or the film, paint the film in a light that is much more kind of um, un an understanding more than a judgment. Uh, I would say and I think it's important when we tell these stories that um, we have time to reflect on uh, we have time to reflect sorry my mum's just commented there so I just saw that but I'll ignore that <laughs> uh, time to reflect on uh, our lives and our stories and and be mindful of of the stories that we're creating I think it's really important it is indeed important and it's also important not to ignore your mum and mum said, I'm so proud of you, Charles, and thank you, everyone. So thank you, Kim. And um, indeed, you know, um, Kim is my sister-in-law, married to my brother. And Kim and Colin every day help people in their community by sharing their experiences of a life through addiction. And only by that do they then help themselves grow you know, now 17 years in recovery, both of them. And uh, with that experience, they're able to help others on their road to recovery. So their art form is just listening and just being there to share. So, so, so proud of you, Kim and Colin as well, and everyone else in the room, including George King. George, thank you very, very much. Love, loving listening. It's also relatable. Indeed, it is, George, um, you know, because our energy is fused, doesn't it? And, and I just want to talk there about under the polarity of understanding and then judgment. You know, one of my favorite um, uh, uh, Indian philosopher authors is Anthony de Mello, who did pass a few years ago. But in his book, Walking on Water, he says something like, find truth in observation, not opinion. Find truth in observation, not opinion, which speaks to your understanding, not judgment, Charles. Now look, also in the um, chat, Sherard, I've put in all of the LinkedIn um, uh, uh, profiles of you, Haida, uh, you, Elizabeth, and Charles. So I encourage everyone to connect with the three of them. Renata, I couldn't find your LinkedIn, but I put your website in there. And of course, uh, and Renata is very active on Facebook, right, Renata? Yeah. And tell us, Renata, your workshops, your art therapy workshops or whatever they're called, your art workshops, are they, can anyone join at any time? Uh, I have several. I have a Saturday morning online uh, for women only. I'm sort of doing women only at the moment, but I'm open to everything. But I am actually about to launch in September uh, art and writing for women who live or have lived with an alcoholic. And I'm, I'm really passionate about that because I really, I know art and writing helps and I'd love to guide people. And that will be more specific than my normal art classes to, that will be about looking at other painters and history and art stories and then telling your own story through painting. And, and I encourage people to write because I think it's so powerful. It's powerful for me, but I, I, and, and sometimes it's, I think it can help if someone can guide you and can sort of steer you in a certain direction and not, not letting it be. I, I loved things that you said as well. I think Charles and, and Heide, to be yeah, positive, to, uh, that, that's my book as well. It's a holistic book. I don't like it when people just, you know, the negativity and the, and the judgment, the judgment on both sides of the, the addict and the people who live 
in that situation, whatever it's 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 huge, and I'm I'm very in favor of looking for the positivity in it and learning from it and and telling other people about it. It's not black and white because it, it was certainly wasn't for me, and it's for nobody in that situation. I'm sure. That's so powerful, Renata. I mean, what I heard there is that everyone's life is their story, right? and everyone's uh, truth is their truth. Yes. Uh, and that's so powerful. Thank you. And and so you said you have um, uh, this writing and art workshop starting in September, did you? Yeah, I will add it on, on my Facebook. And on I, Facebook. You know, people can already enroll now. It's Again, that's only for women. And the reason is because I will create a Facebook group and it's, it's a different okay. thing. That's OK. Don't worry. The, the guys in the room have got it, haven't you guys? You're OK. We'll do one for you another time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no there's no diversity and inclusion conversation here we're good but thank you so much for all you do Renata and all you do thank Elizabeth Ida and Charles now look there's the other the second part of our subheading is telling the truth costs and you already touched a bit on that Ida and and um uh, and so uh, metaphorically you know it costs a lot to tell the truth emotionally right but, you know, the truth needs to be told in order that we have the right information so we can then um, actually be at peace. We don't even have to take action from information. Often we can be at peace. But Elizabeth, um, it must cost a damn fortune to run Glub, Glub, Drug Fam each year. I mean, now with uh, money, Drug Fam each year, with, with actual money. Uh, how do you achieve that? Do you, is it, um, do you, I don't know at all. So do you ask, do you, do you look for donations? Is it the annual conference that supports, et cetera, et cetera? Over to you. Yes, thank you. We we look for, we um, apply to trusts and foundations for funding. Um, some people donate. We have a Just Giving page. We have uh, a link on our uh, website as well to, to make donations. Um, and sponsorship is very important um, to us as well. So these are the means in which we reach out um, to to find funding and secure funding. It's incredibly expensive to run a charity. I mean, I I reflect back to the you know the when I had just me and one phone many years ago, and here we are now all these years on with you know many members of staff that need you know sat to be salaried and and just just the expertise of all those in the team. So it's, it's just really important that we're able to reach out. We have a fantastic uh, finance and fundraising manager, Natalie Archer, and our CEO, Paul Ramp Rampani as well, um, who you know I can introduce to people um, if, that's, if that's how they'd like to get involved. Thank you so much. And actually, you 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 know that brings it home, doesn't it? You know that it it, it then turns in from a one person. Yes. You know, at their kitchen table you yes. know, all, all you entrepreneurs out there you know one person at the kitchen table into you know a whole framework a whole business a whole mm -hmm. you know looking having to look after people inside the organization as yeah. well as outside and you mentioned expertise because of course cost and currency doesn't only come in the form of dollars does it it no. comes in the form of time and it comes in the form of talent. And, and, and Sherrod, you know, we're often talking about the importance, aren't we, of talent in the currency pot. And, and you've got an ROE definition that you might tell us about. What's that? Yeah, ROE is return on engagement because most people or business people talk of ROI all the time. And uh, so we coined this new phrase, ROE, return on engagement. And I think that's very important because uh, whenever we are launching anything, we need to have a community around that. And uh, these days, most businesses are evaluated by the return on engagement that they create. And that, of course, leads to ROI in turn. So uh, that's just uh, some new uh, vocabulary I think we added to our existing dictionary right there. Well, it's very, very important. It's fabulous vocabulary. It sounds much better, doesn't it, to say it's a return on investment all the time, but to talk about return on engagement or return on example. I mean, how powerful is that? And indeed, you know, Charles, look, just us. I know you, you've you written this 12 minute um, short um, uh, story that's going to be made into a film and shot by 
our dear Haida here in the room, him behind the camera, and your other team that you want to treat as indeed Elizabeth treats hers, you know, all with respect and, you know, for their talent, et cetera. And that costs, doesn't it? And I, and I know I'm going to put a Kickstarter link in the, um, in the box here, just in case. I mean, this isn't all about raising money today, everyone. This is all about sharing uh, stories, short, a story sharing, as we've now coined. But Charles, you know, to get this film going, you need uh, £15,000, don't you? And you've raised about 3,000, I believe. Um, how are you gonna go about this? What's next for you, Charles? Yeah, thank you very much. And anyone listening uh, to this webinar today, if you'd like to support the film or support a film about uh, touching on these subject matters that we've been talking to today, you can donate to our Kickstarter. Or if you wanna engage in a bigger conversation around our film, uh, me and Hyder are more than willing to kind of, if you email us or somehow, I don't know how they get hold of us, uh, we could have a chat to you about that if you are kind of uh, around interesting, uh, supporting these interesting stories and these kind of stories that need to be told. Uh, at the moment, yeah, we're raising our money through Kickstarter. So that's where people can donate. And um, we're also um, contacting people, businesses that have a uh, an emotional attachment to these to these stories, mainly around addiction and family. So, so that's how we're going about it at the moment. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you for explaining. Thank you for being so brave. Um, we've heard Elizabeth started, you know, with a pen paper at the table. I know you did too as well, Charles. And I know you want to turn just us into a short series, you know, maybe six or seven stories, including maybe taking mum, can you lend me 20 quid into a 12 minute screenplay and maybe even cheers. Um, or its new name, Renata. I mean, this is also important. So all of you in the room can help support this. So um, um, who, who was it up here said something, Sherrod, about purpose, you know, turning pain into purpose. Um, our, I, I find it, anyway, somebody said that, it's so profound. And that's, yeah. That's one yeah. Of us. It's Karen from Drug Fam, one of our Karen. family support workers, yes. Oh, bless you, Karen. Pain into purpose. Well, back to Simon Sinek. Um, he he likes to use the word purpose and take it bigger and call it your just cause. J-U-S-T, cause, C-A-U-S-E, your just cause. So we could make drug fam and just us our just cause. Um, and on that note, Sherard, may I give it back to you and say yes. thank you for hosting us and bring us a lovely close. No, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank uh, our constellation of stars, all our panelists. Uh, it's been an amazing conversation with a lot of learnings, a lot of takeaways. I want to thank our audience for investing their 75 minutes with us. And on a housekeeping note, a recording of this webinar, along with the podcast, will be on onlywebinars.com uh, sometime afternoon on Monday. So stay tuned for more such conversations. You have to register at only webinars to attend our forthcoming uh, sessions. And thank you, Susan, for putting this all together. It's all your hard work and uh, it's resonated beautifully. And I loved every word that was spoken on this forum and I applaud our panelists and thank you for sharing. So I wanna say bye to our audience, to our panelists and see you on the other side. So bye for now. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, panelists. Yeah. Thank you, audience. Bye. Bye.